it's time for a change. For the longest time, Tesla has been the name in electric cars, and not without good reason. The brand has made them popular, it's made them cool, and above all, it's made electric cars accessible. And to this day, the Tesla Model 3 and the Model Y in their respective segments still represent great value buys. But Tesla doesn't quite have the brand image it once did. Maybe some people are a little pissed off by the most recent comments made by Elon Musk. Maybe they don't like how popular the Tesla brand has gotten. Or maybe they've never really liked Tesla to begin with, but they still want to get into an EV. Well, good thing for those buyers, it looks like BYD is set to be the next big thing in electric cars. Offered at an even more accessible price point, the Chinese brand still stands out with distinctive styling and innovative features. And this one in particular, the Dolphin, looks like it could be the car to elevate the brand to levels of popularity currently enjoyed by Tesla. But is it all it's cracked up to be? Let's find out. Now, at the time we shot this video, the Dolphin was the cheapest electric car you could buy in Australia, with a price tag of $38,890 before on-road costs and state-based incentives. It undercuts its primary rival, the slightly larger MG4, by just $100, and the GWM Aura by $1,100. Still, its price is comparative to many hot-selling combustion cars. Similar dollars will buy you a high-spec Toyota Corolla, for example, making the Dolphin within legitimate reach of many buyers. Now, there are two Dolphin variants in Australia, the entry-level dynamic and top-spec premium. They share more or less the same equipment levels, but they are differentiated by their battery size and their electric motors. You can't talk electric car value without also talking range, but thankfully the Dolphin seems to deliver on this front. The base car has a 44.9 kilowatt hour battery with a WLTP combined 340 kilometers of driving range, while the top spec premium, which we're testing today, ups this to a 60.5 kilowatt hour unit, delivering a more substantial 427 kilometers of WLTP certified range. Now, it's true there are longer range EVs out there, but the Dolphin is small and light, and for a vehicle that's seemingly targeted at city slickers, it's a huge improvement on many similar offerings from more established automakers. Now, BYD is able to achieve that great range to price ratio because it actually builds its own batteries and can make them specifically to suit its cars, unlike other manufacturers who have to buy those batteries from suppliers. It also uses an LFP battery chemistry. Now this is less energy dense, but it's also lighter and it uses less rare materials like cobalt in its construction. If you're left thinking this will be a cheap Chinese car with less than stellar standard inclusions, you can think again. Even the base Dolphin comes loaded with things like 16 inch alloy wheels, LED headlights, a 12.8 inch multimedia touchscreen with nav, as well as Apple CarPlay and Android auto connectivity, electrical adjust for the front seats, keyless entry and push start ignition, climate control, and a comprehensive suite of active safety items. More on those later. Now you wouldn't know it, but overseas BYD actually has quite a wide range of vehicles following a diverse set of styling languages. But here in Australia, its limited range follows quite a consistent design theme that's futuristic and curvy and quite cool. Contemporary touches include the bar light and build your dreams logo emblazoned across the rear, blocky alloy wheel designs painted black and the two-tone body color available on our premium spec car. Of course, there's a complete lack of a traditional grille at the front, and there's also short overhangs and a tall body, which sell the EV deal. It's a bit different, closer in shape to something like the Volkswagen ID3 than anything else on the market. Maybe it won't be for everyone, but perhaps its distinctiveness could be a selling point. Now this interior is a really cool space. It's really distinctive like the rest of this car styling. It's really quite different too, but I think the Dolphin is a bit more toned down than the Addo 3, which had those weird muscle textures and that really intense color scheme as well. There are still things which really stand out in here though. Obviously you've got that huge screen, but some bits that I like include these like circular vent fittings that integrate with this design so nicely. Uh, the, this like rotary touch thing across here, the wheel is really cool. Um, and there's also plenty of excellent textures all throughout this cabin. Yes, the dash is like a hard plastic, but it's got like these kind of vents here, which look like waves. It's got a huge cutout down the middle there, which isn't a storage area, it's just a styling touch. And you've got all sorts of like really great material choices in this cabin, which help this car stand out from the rest of the pack. 
Importantly, you've got this like neoprene material which adorns the dash. And I like this material because it's not as pretentious as a fake leather. It feels better. It's probably gonna age better as well. It even continues through the middle of these seats here. It's a bit of a shame because you still do have a little bit of that fake leather on the sides. I'd almost rather see the whole seat be the neoprene material. Although I will say it doesn't quite breathe as well as some other seat materials like cloth choices that we've seen in cars at this price point as well. All right. so. It looks cool, it feels cool, but is it practical? I think there are areas that are great in this car and there are areas that are not so good. One area that's not so good is just generally the width. It doesn't feel as wide or as open a space as you might get in a price competitor like the MG4 or a more expensive EV rival. Even like a Tesla Model 3 feels a bit more open than the space in here. The color scheme our car has, there are a few interior color schemes, but this one's very dark, so it does feel a little bit extra closed in. And you don't get that big open space down here like you do in some EVs with the flat floor and all that. So you do feel like, you know, you're kind of in a, a very fixed space here. Let's just put it that way. Although I will say there was plenty of headroom for me and it was really quite easy for me to find a nice driving position here as well. Now that's not to say that there aren't some really cool sort of practicality touches all throughout this cabin. You've got a big cutaway here with a tray and a rubberized finish so you could put like your wallet, your keys, your phone here and they're not as likely to exit as they might be in some other cars like Toyotas for example. Um, you've got this really versatile console area that really mixes it up instead of the sort of traditional lifting console box you've got a slide out tray with a big storage area under here two bottle holders they are a bit small so they're kind of for small coffees not for like your big bottle you could put that in the door but even then it's a little height limited there so it's not the best cabin for bottle holders you do have a wireless charger here instead of that opening console nice padded finish here as well but under here you've also got a huge cutaway which really makes a lot of room plenty of storage space under there as well now, obviously this space is designed around having that enormous touch screen and I've got to say for the most part, it really does work. It looks amazing. It's really sharp. It's quite fast. Most of the software is pretty easy to use, although it's not very consistently labeled. So when you first get in, it takes a little bit of getting used to, to try and figure out, you know, what means what in here, um, which is a little bit of a shame. But other than that, it looks amazing. Phone mirroring works really well on it. And of course, just like the Auto 3, you do have the trick of being able to turn it to a portrait layout. I do find that it is a bit of a gimmick. Most of the software does work better when it's in that uh, horizontal layout, especially uh, phone mirroring. It won't actually let me turn the screen when I've got Apple CarPlay uh, turned on. The other thing I noticed about it is when I've got polarizing sunglasses, there is a polarizing film on this screen so that it you know, doesn't reflect the sunlight. I can't actually see the screen at all if it's set to this uh, portrait setting and I've got sunglasses on, so that's something to keep in mind as well. But it is kind of a cool touch and it really does help set BYD apart from the rest of its competitors in this space. Uh, you've also got this rotary dial set up here and you're probably thinking, hey, are most of those climate controls through the screen? Unfortunately, yes, they are. You've got uh, a button here to turn it on and off and an auto setting and a defogger setting. So it's nice that it's not all through the screen and those core functions are still here on this innovative little rotary dial touch, uh, which I quite like. You get a volume control, which is nice. And you also get a drive mode selector and a gear selector. It, it all integrates into this design so nicely, but obviously that does come with the downside that it's not as usable as if you had a full set of climate controls. Let's go have a look in the back seat. Just looking at the form factor of the Dolphin, and I was a little worried that the back seat would be nowhere near as good as competing EVs, because it does look quite small and tight. But now that I'm back here, it's actually a really impressive space. As you can see, behind my own seating position there, I've got leagues of knee room, and plenty of uh, room for my feet too, because the floor is perfectly flat, again, making the most of that electric platform. I will say there is more of an abundance of that sort of cheap fake leather material back here in the center and on the back of this seat here. Although the practicality touches there's a few of those back here too because you've got uh, nice bottle holders in the doors here a sort of hilarious one on the back of this center console which is on an angle so maybe don't put anything too full in there or it's just going to spill on the floor you've got a set of uh, usb ports one usb c one usb a you've got some pockets on the backs of the seats those are really cool sort of all sorts of different shapes and sizes and you've got a drop down armrest here with two halfway decent bottle holders in there as well i will say there are no adjustable rear air vents in here which is worth keeping in mind and uh, you've got a big sunroof that can really help open the space up because of that dark trim as well 
Boot space comes in at 345 liters with the rear seat up or 1,310 liters with it down. We could just fit the whole cars guide luggage set with a little fiddling around and there's a false floor to help make the cargo area level when you fold that second row flat. Plus, it gives you a tidy place to hide all of your charging equipment when the boot isn't in use. The Dolphin also gets vehicle to load, allowing you to power external household devices via its charging port. Very neat and quite rare at this end of the market. Now there are two Dolphin powertrains and both are front wheel drive. The entry level dynamic gets 70 kilowatts and 180 newton meters, which to me, that sounds a little underpowered. While the top spec premium, which is the one we're looking at today, gets 150 kilowatts and 310 newton meters. To me, that's probably worth the extra five grand, not even mentioning the extra 80 or 90 Ks that this one gets in range. Again, this is down to the big jump in battery capacity from 44.9 kilowatt hours in the dynamic to 60.5 in the premium, which in the grand scheme of things are small batteries making their respective 300 40 or 427 kilometer driving ranges quite impressive. Charging on a fast DC unit maxes out at 60 kilowatts for the base car or 80 kilowatts for the top spec. This doesn't sound very fast with many rivals going up to 100 kilowatts or 350 kilowatts, but because the Dolphin's battery sizes are so small, it means you'll still charge from 10 to 80% in a little over half an hour, which isn't bad. For the slower public AC charging, like you might use at your local shops, the Dolphin is limited to 7 kilowatts. Now that's a little behind the 11 kilowatts we like to see for a full EV, but again, because the battery sizes are so small and the Dolphin is pretty efficient, you'll be able to add roughly 50 kilometers of range per hour. Official energy consumption is rated at 14.2 kilowatt hours to 100 kilometers for the premium variant we've tested for this review, and we actually beat that number in our brief time with the car at 14.1 kilowatt hours to 100 kilometers. Now, this has only been quite a brief test with the Dolphin, and this is a very cheap electric car. In fact, it is currently the cheapest electric car, which makes it particularly impressive that the perceived quality in here immediately stands out as being really high. There's none of the kind of usual rattles or crashes or sort of cheap feeling suspension or anything like that that you might get in a really cheap combustion car, for example. And that's what makes this so impressive, the perceived quality being so high for such an affordable electric vehicle. In here, I'm greeted with lots of plush materials, a really quiet cabin. There's a little bit of road noise coming in, but on the whole, this is a really comfortable, serene place to drive around a city in. And its overall driving attributes are really quite good too. I'll talk about that ride quality quickly because it's excellent. And a lot of that's down to the fact that the Dolphin isn't very heavy for an electric car. Its curb weight is almost equivalent to that of a slightly larger combustion car actually. And that means it's got a really resolved ride quality. There's none of the usual crashing and bashing we get from other more affordable uh, EVs in the space which struggle to deal with the weight of their lithium batteries. The steering is really good too. I would expect a cheap electric car like this to have really heavily electrically assisted steering, like even more expensive Kias and Hyundai's feel really artificial when it comes to the way the steering feels, especially in the corners. But here in the BYD, it's, it's quite nicely balanced. It feels really resolved when you turn it into a corner and that makes this little car quite fun to drive. Now this high spec one does have the better of the two motors and it's still not that fast, which makes me think that the base car, which we haven't driven, will feel a little underpowered. But here you get enough power to sprint from zero to hundred kilometers in just over seven seconds. And that's pretty impressive. It's not hot hatch fast, uh, but it's not a slouch either. And the power delivery is reasonably sort of linear and smooth. It feels appropriate for a car this size. However, this does bring us to one of this car's major downsides, and that's the stock tires that it ships with. It is quite easy to break the traction, even with that smooth sort of power on tuning that this motor has. And it doesn't inspire confidence in the corners either. There is a fair bit of tire torture as the weight of those batteries are thrown around. So it's not perfect. And it, it's such a shame that this car ships on cheap tires because it would be so much better on like a decent set of even Korean tires as opposed to the Chinese ones that it's on. So I think this car will even improve over time as you replace the tires for something a little bit better. Now I do appreciate lots of little things that are missing from other EVs like the fact that this car actually does have an instrument cluster mounted on this column. So it doesn't show an awful lot of information and it's not customizable 
at all, but it does show you all the core information right in front of your eyes there, and that's something that a Tesla Model 3 doesn't have, so I like that. Even these big areas on this touchscreen here are pretty easy to work with. As I said before, there are a few puzzling submenus, but on the whole, the big screen's pretty easy to use. So I've got to say, with a lot of its traits added up, it really does feel like kind of like a normal combustion car to drive. There's nothing too weird about, as I said, the steering. There's nothing too weird about the suspension. It, this is a pretty straightforward little vehicle. When it comes to the EV stuff, uh, there's some interesting things. So firstly, just like the Auto 3, it doesn't have a single pedal regen mode. So you do have to use the brake and it uses kind of like a blended uh, regen and disc brake setup in there as well. So it feels pretty normal, like organic to drive. If you're coming out of a combustion car, it's not going to be too wild. You can turn the regen up a little bit, but it's still not a one pedal driving mode. So if that's something that you are enjoying in maybe a Leaf or something, that's something that's not present in the Dolphin. You do get three drive modes, which alter your range and drive experience quite a bit. And there's also two steering modes. So there's a light steering mode and a normal steering mode or a sporty steering mode. Uh, both are actually pretty good. I don't have a problem with them and the drive modes, Eco kind of takes the wind out of the motor's sails and it will actually switch the aircon off. Uh, normal seems to be the best balance and putting it in that sport mode will make it a little bit more prone to braking traction in those front wheels. Um, but you know, it can be fun to play with. So on the whole, I'm really impressed with the Dolphin. This is the cheapest electric car you can buy right now and it doesn't feel cheap at all. It actually steers quite nicely. The ride quality is really good. It doesn't feel super unusual if you're coming out of a combustion car. It's, it's quite a normal car to drive as well. And it's just got all sorts of sort of quality and creature comforts that you don't normally get even in a cheap combustion car. So you can do much worse than this. This is an impressive entry point to getting into an EV. It's quite easy to park the Dolphin too, thanks not only to its minimal dimensions, but also its very good surround camera suite. Although I will say rear visibility is quite limited because the rear window is tiny and the headrests are massive. The Dolphin was just awarded a maximum five-star ANCAP safety rating, and it's got seven airbags in here, as well as the full suite of active safety items. Now, a lot of Chinese cars do have all the active safety items, but they're not well calibrated and they're a bit annoying. Most of the Dolphin systems have been great in the time I've had the car, but the lane keep assist can be a bit of a bully, so I'm inclined to turn it off, and it is on every time you start the car. So if you really don't like that feature, you do have to go through the rigmarole of turning it off every time you go. The Dolphin is covered by a six year or 150,000 kilometer warranty, which beats many mainstream rivals in terms of length, but not kilometers driven. It's behind in this segment though, as MG, GWM and Kia all get ahead with their seven year and unlimited kilometer promises. Service pricing is available all the way out to 96 months or 160,000 kilometers, and it averages out to $299 per year, which is pretty good. It's worth noting though that many rivals only need to see a workshop every 24 months instead of the 12 month interval we're seeing here. Chinese manufacturers have been impressing us so much lately with the absolute strides they've been making and BYD is no exception with the Dolphin. Not only does it help bring the price down for prospective EV buyers, but it's also a lot of fun to drive. And sure, it's not the most practical, nor is it the fastest EV even at this price, but when it boils down to it, it's just great electric car value.